Okay. So what we're going to do is look at John chapter 11, and we're just going to go through it verse by verse and asking ourselves a few things. Uh, maybe it'll provoke, provoke other thoughts as you go along. Whether we trace those thoughts, who knows? But this is, this is how it goes. John chapter 11 is the death of Lazarus or the going to sleep of Lazarus. And I'm reading the New King James. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Interesting there, Lazarus means um, whom God helps. Uh, so even in his name, his name means whom God helps. And we're going to see that in this story. Also, the town of Bethany. Bethany means house of poverty. This is just two miles east of Jerusalem. And it's kind of thought that it's where people impoverished and sick and weak would actually hang out outside of Jerusalem. Just, to, you know, far enough away that they don't defile the folks of Jerusalem is the idea. And this was the house of poverty. Not to say that necessarily Lazarus, Mary and Martha were poor, but it should not surprise us that we find Jesus visiting the house of poverty, that he feels at home in the house of poverty, that as he goes into the region of Judea, he doesn't stay in the metropolitan area of Jerusalem. He stays at Bethany, the house of poverty. He was born in a stable. And so there it is, a certain man, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. John calls Bethany the town of Mary. If we go back and look at Luke, Luke calls it Martha's place. And so, but nobody calls it Lazarus town or Lazarus's place. It's always uh, Mary and Martha. Oh yeah, and their brother Lazarus kind of a thing. And so uh, there's a guy named Jean, Jean Venet. Uh, um, he's since passed away, but he started this thing called L'Arche or La Arch. It's a, it's a community for those with special needs, community with people who are not quite capable of living individually by themselves. And he would create these community groups where they are all together and they'd have someone who was a little bit more adept at living in this world be with them and they would just have a community. And so he has a commentary on John chapter 11, John Finney is his name, um, that talks about how Lazarus was one of these special needs guys. And Mary and Martha were their was a sister and they took care of him and that it wasn't uncommon for Lazarus to uh, be taken care of by these. That's why we see him every time we see him, he's quiet in the whole scene at, in, in all the areas. And it's always Mary and Martha mentioned first instead of Lazarus. So it's a really beautiful commentary with that scenario in mind. You're just like, that's beautiful. So anyway, it's the town of Mary, according to John. It's the town of Martha, according to Luke. Basically, all three of them there, and they're of renown. The three amigos. And as John is pinning this story, to add it into his gospel, it provokes to his memory, whenever Mary's name is mentioned, that idea, that episode, the memory of when she anointed Jesus' feet. It provokes him so much that after he gets done hastily sharing with us the last public ministry of Jesus, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, the next story he tells us about is, and, and remember when I said that was Mary who anointed Jesus' feet? Well, let me tell you about how that went down. And he tells us how Mary anointed Jesus' feet in the next chapter. So it seems to us, it seems to me anyway, that as John is writing this, he is, he was rather moved by that story. You can imagine, here we are, if we are in the house of poverty, demonstrating extravagance for not, for no purpose. There is no productivity out of it. You're just pouring out money, throwing money into the fireplace is how some people viewed it when Mary poured out this rich ointment on Jesus's feet. And you say, what a waste. Of course, you can imagine all these poor people thinking, do you know what I could be? I could be so you can imagine people getting up in arms in that particular scenario. But that's skipping ahead to John chapter 12. That Mary, who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, or as Paul says, her glory. A woman's hair is her glory. She wasn't afraid to do that. Whose brother Lazarus was sick. It's nice to know that he doesn't say, 
And that's that Martha who got distracted with much serving. Cause that's how I say it, you know, like the town of Mary and her sister, Martha, you know, that Martha, the one that always got distracted. Yeah. John doesn't make reference to that. So that's something to be grateful for. And then therefore the sister sent to Jesus saying, Lord, behold, he whom you phileo is sick. Doesn't say his name. Doesn't make any requests. Simply states the fact we're going to leave it in your hands. You get to do what you want to do. Remember last week, we looked at the woman with the issue of blood. Jairus came and said, here's the vision. This is how I imagine it happening. You're going to come. You're going to touch her. And she's going to be made well. And then that woman with the issue of blood, she thought, all I got to do is touch his him. And when I touch the tassel on his gown, I'm going to be made well. Mary, Martha and Martha just said, you just, you just come. All, all I'm saying is, matter of fact, she doesn't even say come. Lord. Behold, he whom thou phileo is sick. She doesn't have a vision board. She just says, I trust you with it. So long as he's breathing, I trust you with it. And so she probably, even though she doesn't enunciate it, she does have in her mind eye that Jesus is going to get this word from the messenger and he is going to respond immediately. Because clearly she had that because of the disappointment we find later on. And when Jesus heard that, he said, the sickness is not unto death, is not going to end in death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So he tells the messengers that. Maybe the messengers are like, can this guy get any more cryptic? You know, he says, okay, let's go. Great. It's not unto death. Come on, let's go. And he's like, no, I'm not going with you. So I don't know what's going through the messenger's head there. And Jesus saying the things that he's saying. Sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. The Son of God, he's thinking of himself. Now Jesus, Agapeo, Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. This is my favorite chapter because it has the whole waiting thing. The reason Jesus waited is because he loved them. And this is a chapter on Martha's waiting, but you could just as well say this is Jesus is waiting. He has to wait the two days as well. The day that the messengers do that day's journey to get to them, to get to Jesus, apparently he was on the eastern side of the Jordan. They get to Jesus that day, and by the time he got there, Lazarus is dead, as we would say it. So there's a one day. Then Jesus waits two days. That adds up to three. Then they have to take a fourth day to get there, and that adds, adds up to the fourth day that Lazarus was dead. And it was because he loved them that he waited, because he Love them that he went. It's love that drives him on all these things. What did he do for those two days? So when Jesus heard that he that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was on the eastern side of the Jordan. He did not make haste. He did not go. He, did, he knew what Martha and Mary were expecting. And yet he did not do what people expected him to do. And there's going to be some times in our lives where we're going to have to stand our ground and say, this looks odd. This doesn't seem right. It seems unwise, but I am not going to do what people are expecting of me at the present moment. And he did not. And those two days, I can just imagine him wrestling or, or uh, powwowing and contemplating with the father what the will is going to do. Maybe he's planning up how he's going to respond to Martha. In his mind, I he can be thinking, oh, I can just picture Martha's going to come out and she's going to be like, don't you care about my brother dying? You know, kind of like she did in Luke 10. And she can he can imagine Mary being devastated and very emotional and high strung. And so as he's contemplating this, he is plotting out how I, how am I going to meet them each in their own language? each in their own need. There's one love language and then there's that comfort language and he's going to meet them. Martha needs to have a theological discussion in order for herself to be comforted. Whereas Mary just weep with her and she'll be comforted. And so, you know, I'm not for sure Jesus actually had to stop and contemplate these thoughts, but it would be a good thing for us to do. Not a one shoot, one size fits all kind of thing. So something, he was doing something for those two days. The disciples don't even seem to be aware of what's going on. He lingers. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Haven't you read the headlines? Haven't you heard? They are out to stone you. Matter of fact, 
Last time you were in Judea, John chapter 9, you know what he did? He healed the man who was born blind. And if that didn't get people in an outrage, he was right there confronting the Pharisees face to face. No innuendos, no hints, no clues. He was right there. Matter of fact, at the end of John chapter 9, even the man who was healed was kicked out of church, was kicked out of the synagogue. We don't want any evidence in our, in our way. And they sought for a way to kill him. And so they go to the east side of the Jordan. And now a chapter later, Jesus saying, you know, let's go to Judea. Wouldn't that be fun? And the disciples like, no, no, it wouldn't be fun. Look at the headlines. They show them the New York Post and they give them the St. Louis Post Dispatch. And they're like, there is no good reason we should be in Judea. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, <laughs> lately the Jews sought to stone you. And are you going there again? You think this is a smart idea? There's many times, listen, next time you read through the Gospels, look for all the times where you can sense in an unspoken way or even in a spoken way where the disciples are doubting the sanity and the common sense of their leader. Like, you know, this just doesn't sound good at all. You know, you go in there like last week, uh, Jesus goes into this little girl's bedroom, Tabitha, and, and says, little girl. She's, she's, she's just sleeping and they just go, oh, why did he have to say that in front of everybody? Now everybody thinks we're wackos, you know? So just to read through the gospels with that lens is really fascinating. And sometimes see yourself there. Are you sure that's a good idea to go there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And what he's saying there, oh, some people think that what, one of the things he's saying is that there's only 12 hours before the Passover begins and he's got to go through his trial. I think more particularly, he's saying, I am in sync with the father. Anyone who walks in the spirit, who walks with the father is in the light. And he's saying, walk with the father and it doesn't matter. They could be out to stone me. They could be out to arrest me. They could be out to silence me. It doesn't matter so long as I'm in the will of God. James could say it in Acts chapter four. Of course, it cost him his head, but he was walking in the light. Peter could say it. He was arrested at the same time as James, and he was man managed to get a, an escape with an angel escort. But they were both walking in the light. Our time will come when the Lord has it set. And that's what Jesus is saying. Walk with God. If he leads you into the lion's den, so be it. Um, that song put out by Mercy Me, even if, even if it, it shall be well with my soul so long as I'm walking in the light, light of the world. These things he said, you know, I'm sure the disciples are still scratching their head. You still really haven't answered us. Do you think going to Judea is a good idea? He has answered him. He said, I'm doing the father's will. I'm doing the father's time. Listen, there are two other times where Jesus had requests from people who loved him and were near and dear to him. Mary asks him, Jesus, we're at this wedding and we are without wine. You can read about it in John chapter two. Mary, very dear to Jesus, says we are without wine. Do something. And Jesus says, what have I to do with you? My time has not yet come. And he puts off, he does not respond immediately to Mary, but later on he responds and he ends up making the best wine taste buds have ever had. He delayed answering Mary. Another time someone that was very dear to him asked a request in John chapter 7 and, and his brothers say, come on, let's go to Jerusalem. That way you can show off and do all your miraculous deeds and they'll believe in you. Come on, let's do it, Jesus. Now they probably were mocking him. Matter of fact, I think the scripture says, uh, see, these are all things we would be chasing down if I had done my homework. But I think they said, uh, the, the writer said they did not believe at this time. So, but they're still dear to Jesus. And they said, Jesus, let's go to Jerusalem. And Jesus says, I will not go to Jerusalem and I will not go to the festival at this time. And he delays. He delayed answering Mary and he ended up getting greater glory from it. He delays answering his brothers. He ends up going to Jerusalem and going to the festival. And, uh, and that's where he gets to have that whole John chapter eight, uh, that woman caught in adultery, uh, that whole revelation of Jesus's ministry. And then here, 
someone very near to him asked for help and he delays it. These people whom he loved, not just Mary and Martha and Lazarus, but his brothers, his mother, he delays it and it ends up for greater good. The whole book is about that, isn't it? Waiting, bringing glory to God and betterment to us. It's not just so God, at least God got the glory. All I got was a two year, two days older. Huh. No, no, we get in the good of it too. God is well able to economize that his glory ends up being for our better as well. These things he said after and he said to them, our friend, <laughs> our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. <laughs> Lord, there, there's really no need to go wake him up. There's, there, the disciples are still looking at him like, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll call a wake up call. <laughs> we, we don't have to be the ones. There's other people who are safe in Jerusalem that could go wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. No doubt, man. If a person can sleep when they're sick, they're on the upward trajectory. They're getting some rest. And this is interesting. However, Jesus spoke of Lazarus's death, but they thought he was speaking about taking a rest. And there are times where Jesus actually uses the word death. So it's not all the time that a believer dies that he calls it a sleep. There is death. But we're going to see here as we read the rest of these that there is a distinction between the body dying and, and co corrupting and decaying versus the spirit. The spirit shall never die. When he says, come on to me, all ye that thirst, that's the time he went to Jerusalem for the festivals when his brothers asked him to, but he didn't do it according to their time. He did go and he said, I come on to me and I will give you water and it will be living and you and you will never thirst. Eat of me and you will never hunger. So there's this recognition that there is a spiritual life. There is an alternate reality. There is another universe. And it's where we never thirst, we don't hunger, and we never die. So there is this thing that's going on down here, which is almost like a type, a shadow, as it were, of the greater thing that's going on up there. And so he says, I'm not talking about real sleeping. It's just the metaphor that I was using for death. He's dead. He says it to them. Jesus, how did you know he's dead? Who told you? As far as the last news you heard is that Lazarus was sick. And yet you're telling us he's dead. How did you know this? Uh-huh. How did he know this? He must be the son of God, that kind of thing. Lazarus is dead, he says plainly to them. So he knew that he is omniscient, even in his in the flesh. And I am glad for your sakes, you disciples sake, that I was not there, that you may believe. I am glad for you believers in me who have followed me for three years, that for your sake, I was not there because you are, there has been things I have been sharing with you since the Mount of Transfiguration about persecuted and put to death. And then I will rise again in three days. You've been having problems wrapping your mind around this so that you can believe the prediction about myself and my resurrection is viable and possible. I am going, I am going to wait two days in pain and I'm going to go there and show you that I have resurrection power, that there is life in me. And so he says, I am glad for your sake. So disciples, maybe he was doing it for the disciples sake. He was doing it for the father's glory. He's doing it for the disciples sake. We're going to find out he's doing it for Mary and Martha's sake. That we, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. And then good old Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, come on, gang, let us go too, that we may die with him. Such enthusiasm for death. You know, a lot of these people who make strong professions in Christ have a bad rap, you know, doubting Thomas. But doubting Thomas, he is the one who was able to declare after Jesus made himself known, he says, my Lord and my God. He doesn't even bother with the son of God. He acknowledges right then and there. He is God. Nathaniel, the bigot, the prejudiced guy. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Oh, he's so prejudiced, isn't he? And yet... Jesus does his thing and he says, well, I perceive thou art the Christ. And you're like, well, that's pretty strong profession. Peter, he has a reputation of denying the Lord. If we were to go up to anybody and say, what do you know about Peter? Well, I know he's a coward. <laughs> but lo and behold, we see Peter there. They're underneath the shrines to idols at Caesarea Philippi. Jesus says, who do you say that I am? 
He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And so you have all these people who have reputations otherwise in our psyche. We think ill of them in a way who have made some very loud declarations of who Jesus is. And we're going to see Martha doing the same thing here in a little bit. The idea here, there's been talk about why is Thomas called the twin, Didymus? And it's because people say that Thomas looked like Jesus. And that he was Jesus's twin in appearance only. And so for Thomas to go wandering the streets of Judea, looking like Jesus, he said, he put it, the gauntlet down. I am ready to go to Jerusalem because I know it's going to cost me my death looking like you. You know, go get your hair cut, dye it. What, you know, don't. He's like, I'm ready to go. So Thomas, he may not know exactly what he was getting into, but you can say this. He was loyal and he knew wherever Jesus went is where I want to be. Matter of fact, I think it was Thomas that also provoked Jesus to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, Thomas says some things that often is provocative to Christ. And that's in John 14, I would, 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days, like I explained earlier. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. He is close to the guillotines. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now, Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, so there must have been other people that were on their way to Martha's house and ran ahead and said, guess who's coming? He's finally coming. And maybe when they're reporting to Martha, he's coming like, yeah, it's about time. What is he here for the reception and the food? Like, where was he when? But somehow Martha heard about it and went and met him. This is breaking a lot of conventionalities. Actually, when there's a funeral going on, you're supposed to stay secluded in your home and just wail seven days. And so this is the fourth day and Mar Martha gets up and goes out and breaks conventionalities and says, I need to meet Jesus. All I know is I need to go to Jesus, even in the midst of this morning state, especially in the midst of this morning state. So when you're going through a crisis and everyone says, you need to work out a plan, you need to do this, just keep going to Jesus, even though they're saying, wait, wait, don't do that. We have to come up with a plan. She goes out, meets him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now, Martha said to Jesus, almost seems like privately with, you know, as private as you can have with 12 boys hanging around. Lord, and she's standing. Now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. She says this through tears. There's almost like an accusation in there, and yet it's an honest accusation. She knows it's true. I've seen it happen. I've read reports. I've been keeping up with you. If you had been here, this would not have happened. And she kind of loses hope and faith after the last breath is taken. And yet even has somehow she still says, but I still believe in you, even in the midst of these desperate situations. Even though my brother's dead, even though I did not get what I want. How many people do you know who have left the faith, they might say, because somebody precious and special to them has passed away? Why don't you believe anymore? Well, because they weren't there to take care of my mother when she had cancer. Well, Martha went through the same thing, and yet she ends up saying, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. I know you're still someone to be trusted, someone to be followed. Clearly, she did not have in her mind that that meant, oh, Jesus is going to go over there and raise him from the dead. We know she did not have that in mind. Because when Jesus does go over there and tries to raise him from the dead, whoa, 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 she says, Lord, he stinketh. My brother say that about me all the time, and I'm not even dead. Um, <laughs> sibling rivalry, I don't know. But if she had expected that Jesus could do something, she would not have gone into this panic mode of saying, Lord, he stinks. So he was thinking something like, maybe you can heal this broken heart. Maybe you could take away this ache. I just know that whatever you ask of God, it shall happen. And, and just to say this, you know, Kathy always prays that God would answer exceedingly abundantly up above and beyond all that we ask or think or fantasize or imagine and all that kind of thing. She, her imagination couldn't go there, it seems like. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. So he's entering into a theological discourse with him. 
he does take time to discuss theology with women. We see it there in John chapter four, where he's discussing the difference between the Samaritan faith and the Jewish faith. So for those who want it anyway, Martha said to him, I know that my brother will rise again and I am willing to wait X number of years for that to happen. But I wasn't really willing to wait the two days that it took you. I, I can wait for the sweet by and by now that he's dead, but gosh, I wish you had been here. And she says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. It wasn't very, you don't find a lot of resurrection passages in the Old Testament, but by the time the rabbis had spoken on the Old Testament and the rabbi spoke on the rabbis who spoke on the Old Testament and et cetera, et cetera, resurrection was a very popular notion except for the Sadducees at this time. And so Martha is one of those who believes in the resurrection in the last day. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? There's a two ways of looking at this. That it's, it's two different ways of explaining the same thing. That our spirit will never die. There will never ever be separation from God. We will go on. That essence and core of who we are will continue. Um, but it could also be the idea that those who are dead in Christ, who have died, they shall live. And those who haven't died in Christ and live, they shall never die when Christ returns. So you could read it as two separate groups at the return of Christ, or you can just read it as this is the description of Christians. We shall not die. And though it looks like we're dying, we do have coffins. We do have funerals. He says, for them, it is not death. For those who remain behind, there may be a death of a piece of our heart. And so I am the resurrection in the sweet by and by kind of a thing. And I am the life in the present. We can experience life in the present. Do you believe this? He says to Martha. And she's like, I don't have no clue what you just said. Because she kind of goes off on her own little answer. She says, yeah, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who is to come into the world. I don't know about all that other business about the resurrection and the life and about he who dies but doesn't die and lives and all that. But I do know this, that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, and you have come into the world. So it's this great profession of faith by that distracted woman, Martha, we would say. We'd expect this kind of confession from Mary but not the way Martha, uh, Martha goes about it. So it's interesting the way she answers that question. That is a big, and you can imagine the question that she has based on that question. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I would have said, are you saying I'll never die? Well, then why did Lazarus die? And if he dies, when will he live? You know, I would have been going on all these questions. And she says, there is some absolutes that I know. You are the Christ. You are the son of God. And you've come into the world to save it. Now, you need to establish some truths for our own faith. They're, these are my faith. When I'm reading through scripture, I say, this is one thing, one absolute truth that I am certain of. God is good. When I'm reading through scripture, I view it through that lens. When I'm looking at life circumstances, I view it through that lens. For Martha, her indisputable truth, her anchor, her ground wire was, thou art the Christ, the son of God. That's much I know. And everything will be viewed through that lens. It's, it's as if to say it will keep us, keep our little vessel from getting tempest and tossed by all kinds of doubts and philosophies. So Martha makes a great confession. And when Martha had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. So we don't have everything that Mar Martha and Jesus talked about. Apparently, Jesus said to Martha, go get Mary. Go bring her here. I want to meet her out here instead of going to her. And so Martha did just that as secretly as she could. I don't know how secret you could be when you have all these professional and friendly mourners coming around you wailing. But she hooks up with Mary. 
And the teacher has come. That's how she refers to him. She just called him the Christ, the son of God. But when she gets to marry the teacher, you know, the one who you love to be a student of, who you like to sit at the feet of and learn has come and is calling for you. And as soon as Mary heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Even there, you see, there's a hint of faith in Mary. Like she's like, I don't, I know he could have been here. He could have saved it, but I'm not bitter. I am not, I know this. I still have to take my sorrow to him. And she quickly arose and came to him. Now, Jesus had not come yet into town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. Like she just wants to get one last glimpse. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she didn't stand there. She did not have a discourse with him. She fell down at his feet. Three times we see Mary at the feet of Jesus. Luke chapter 10. We read that story when we were doing the homework for this. John chapter 12. She's anointing his feet with her hair. And then here he's at his feet. So Mary's position when she's with Jesus is always at his feet, at his feet as a student, as a learner, at his feet as a worshiper there when she's pouring out ointment upon his feet and here as a, as a mourner, as a, as a desperate individual. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Every time she approached Jesus, he's at his feet. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Have you and Martha been saying this a lot to each other because it's like verbatim you're getting your story straight before you go before a court of law but it's the same thing so it's to to just take time to read it through different intonations was it accusatory was it mourning was it like oh gosh i wish you could have gotten here sooner therefore when jesus saw her weeping and the jews who came with her weeping that's wailing he groaned in his spirit and was troubled can't tell you how much debate there is about why he was groaning and why he's troubled. Some people say he's angry, angry at sin, angry at all the mourners as if they were false mourners. But he was groaning in the spirit and was troubled, groaning that this is what happens. The delays are hard on his people. He knows the delays are hard. He recognizes it causes us grief, that it makes us wail when he waits. And yet he's just like, oh, I wish there was a better way. But this is how it is. And he said, as if he doesn't know. Anytime, that's another good thing. Read through the Gospels and ask yourself, why is Jesus asking this question when he already knows? He says, where have you laid him? You don't, you don't know? You're the son of God? I guess got done saying you're the Christ? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And that ought to encourage us. When Jesus asks us to share with others and to comfort with others and to visit one another, this is the pure religion, to visit widows and, and, and the fatherless. He's not saying because I can't do it. He's just inviting us to participate with him. He actually calls us co-laborers together with him. He's, he's letting us do what those parts that we can do. And we're going to see that again here in this story. But he says, can you lead me to where Lazarus is buried? He's letting us participate. He's letting us do what we can do. He says, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. Come and see. You, the rings true of what happened in John chapter one. When Philip is witnessing to Nathaniel and Nathaniel says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He says, come and see. <laughs> so just that invitation, come and see. Anyway, where have you laid him? We get to participate with him. And when he got the, you know, where have you laid him? Maybe they're thinking, is he, he wants to see where the gravestone is? Does he actually think he wants to see the coffin where he was buried? Have one last look at him? Is this is going to be his farewell? They don't know why he's asking, but they're like, come and see. And when he gets there, Jesus wept. He wept. With Mary, with Martha, he had a theological dialogue. He met her in their mind. She's, she's one of those that has to get her mind wrapped around it in order for there to be peace. Whereas Mary is just one of those emotive, emotional, I can't believe you weren't here. And she's crying and Jesus weeps with her. 
Jesus is meeting each one of them exactly where they need to be, meeting them with their comfort language. What's going to comfort them? And as we go and minister to people, we want to ask the same thing. What's their personality type? What may or may not minister to them? To some, it may be silence. Don't push. Don't beg the details. And to other people, you're just going to say, they, I'm going to keep grilling them. I want them to be able to vent and tell me exactly what's going on. You're going to have to ask that with each person that you're dealing with. And that's what Jesus is doing. And so he weeps. And the Jew, and there's two, they say this is the shortest verse in the Bible, but there's also pray continually, rejoice always, Jesus wept. And so when we're happy and we're rejoicing always, direct it towards God. And when we're sad, you can weep, but direct it towards God. And in all circumstances of life, pray, pray continually. Whether it's happy times, rejoicing always, whether it's sad times, Jesus wept, whether it's no matter what time, pray continually. Those are the three shortest verses word-wise. Don't start counting the letters. Then the Jew said, see how he loved them, even in the way he wept. And the same Jews, maybe these are the Jews from Jerusalem that came, oh man, you are in a heap of trouble. That blind guy that you healed, he is telling everybody and it has the Pharisees up in arms. And they said, look, if he loved Lazarus, if they only knew that Jesus loved them too. That same kind of a God they love, the same kind of care for him. See how he loved them. People can see our love. And that's not to say let's all go out and cry so that we can, I'm just saying, how we behave. And some of this said, could not this man, Jesus, they call him man, who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? But here they're saying, this is, this is somebody's fault. It's his fault. If he had been here. Kind of the same thing Mary and Martha were saying. If only they had been here. If only Jesus had been here. Maybe they heard Mary and Martha talking. But that idea of saying that someone has to be at blame for it. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. There he is again. He's letting us participate. He led, they, we got to lead him to the tomb. We get to remove the stone away. And then at this point, we see that Martha really did believe. She had a faith that said, you, whatever you ask about, it can happen. But it wasn't that strong of a faith because Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. And there's this idea that the Jews have that, after the third day, the spirit hovers around the first three days to see if there's a possibility I can sneak back in and come back to life. Third day comes and goes. The spirit says, up, oh, the door's really closed. I'm leaving. And so it was the fourth day after the spirit had left. In other words, where he's making a very strong point um, that Lazarus is bonafide dead. There is two other times where Jesus raised people from the dead. Mark uh, chapter five. Remember, we read about last week, Jairus has his little daughter, and the servants come to him and say, Jairus, don't batter the teacher anymore. Your daughter's dead. And Jesus is right there on the heels, and he raises her to life. You're like, well, yeah, but the spirit was still hovering around looking for a way to enter, and Jesus gave it to her. You know, so people could say, oh, it was just a coma. It was a whatever. So the second person that he heal, uh, raises from the dead is in Luke chapter 11, and that was a woman who hadn't yet buried her son. It was a widow who had not yet buried her son. They were carrying him the coffin to the tomb to bury it. So he had been dead longer than Jairus' daughter, but not all that long, less than Lazarus, and Jesus raises them from the dead. And they're like, hmm, I bet this is a natural cause for this. There is this, maybe he, whatever, they could do the natural cause thing, but the spirit was still hovering. Lazarus here, four days, and it's the week before Jesus goes, does his passion week. It's as if to say he's trying to strengthen the faith of the disciples here. Take a uh, Lord, there he stinketh, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So no, Jesus is not from the state of Missouri. State of Missouri says, show me, and then I'll believe. First, believe, and then you will see. 
Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that you have heard me. Wait, did we miss a prayer somewhere? What, what, what prayer did you, are you thinking that he, God heard you? I suspect he spent two days praying. Those two days while he was waiting and Martha and Mary were waiting were not wasted. He is praying to the Father, wrestling with him. He thanks you, Lord, for hearing me during that time. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. That's an interesting thing that I would be chasing down is the different times that Jesus cried out with a loud voice. In the Old Testament, it says he lifted not up his voice. So he wasn't one of those that was a yeller just for yelling sake. That if you speak louder, I will dominate this conversation and you won't get a word in. He wasn't that kind of guy. But we do know that in Matthew chapter 11, he cried out there at the temple. He says, come on to me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says that. And then here he cries out too, Lazarus, come forth. And I don't know, man, I'm trying to picture this. Is Lazarus like coming out like a penguin? waddling with his face covered up and he can't see and he bumps into the wall you know because he's faith he's got the faith cloth and i mean is he coming in like the way larry and bob used to hop and veggie tails is he floating above the ground is he hovering how did he come out but he cries out lazarus come forth and somehow lazarus mummified and with a faith cloth on his head is able to come out and he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, participate yet again with me, he says to the people surrounding him. Um, Loose him and let him go. We get to be the ones that get to help loose the, the wraps and the bonds that are on people. Cloths that are keeping people blind from seeing some of the beautiful things of who Christ is and what is his heart towards us. We get to participate in that kind of a ministry. Loosing, uh, loose him and let him go. And 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 I'm sure I, w- I would have been speechless and mo- motionless. Like what just happened? Maybe I would have taken a deep breath. He doesn't smell too bad. It seems okay. You know, I, I would have been assessing the whole situation. But immediately he calls us to action. And when Jesus raised from the dead, he did not raise with grave clothes on. Lazarus was resuscitated. Then we'll just read here at the end, which I find quite fascinating. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him. Reaction number one, they believed in him. Like, I was there. I saw it. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus had done. Then the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. They are not even discussing, are these miracles true? You know, I'm sitting there talking about Benny Hinn to a lot of my African friends over there in Zambia. They love Benny Hinn. And they're assessing, are these miracles or signs and wonders even true? The Pharisees know they're true. They're not even trying to come up with a lie. There's too many witnesses. There's too many of them. And and so they're acknowledging, what are we going to do? This guy works miracles. I would say, follow him. Instead, they say, we got to do something with him. If we leave him alone, everyone will believe in him. So there's this thing of greed. There's this thing of power. How there's certain aspirations that we strive for that can blind us to the wonder working power of Jesus. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest of that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. In other words, Rome would get very upset that Jesus was establishing a kingdom. And not for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Caiaphas is making this prophecy more because of what his office is as high priest rather than necessarily him believing. But he's, he doesn't know it, but he's prophesying this substitutionary death of Jesus. And he's also prophesying that, Jesus, that he's going to gather in these scattered people. 
what Jews and Gentiles. Then from that day on, guess what they did? Because they raised Lazarus from the dead, they plotted to put him to death. Oh, that'll work out good. Sometimes you watch some of these uh, hero movies and they're trying to fight off these big monsters that come from Mars or some other alien planet with their little BB guns. Like, oh, that's going to be helpful. So here they are trying to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim and there remained with his disciples. And this is how come we know it's close to his death. Now, the Passover the, of the Jews was near. And many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast? Do you think he'll come or not? And if he does come, what do you think he's going to do? You think he's going to clean out the money changers? Now, both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where Jesus was, that they should report it, that they might seize him. You know what? If you find out where this guy who has the power to raise people from life Report it to us so that we can seize them. The synoptic gospels make it sound like it was Jesus's cleansing of the temple that caused the, the Pharisees to pursue him to death. John makes it sound like later on when you read it, that it was because he raised Lazarus from the dead that they wanted to kill him. That you'd want to kill somebody because they gave new life to somebody. It's a marvel. Jesus had to wait during this time. Martha had to wait during this time. Lazarus had to wait. I suspect his waiting was much more joyous than ours. Four days in the presence of God. Um, let's pray. Gracious God, I don't know how many stories we would have to read. We've already looked at seven or eight of them already of where your timing was perfect. Your delays were intentional and for good. And yet our heart cries out, we want it now. Why is he saying no? Where is he? God, I pray that you would calm our hearts, that you would soothe our hearts with these truths that we've seen from Martha's life, from Mary's life, Jesus's life, that we would be able to rest in certain grounding truths that you are good and you do all things well, that you are the son of God and are powerful, that, that you're not up in heaven wringing your hands, sweating, wondering, oh no, this got out of control. It's going to be a Jurassic Park kind of a thing that you really are in control. So Father, I pray that somehow today, even now, you would strengthen those truths in our heart and our minds, that they would be steadying for us, that we'd be able to cling to them even when our vessel is being tossed to and fro by the tumultuous waves that our anchor in Christ and our anchor truths would hold firm while we wait. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word that's available to us so freely, the freedom to meet here the way we do. And so we pray, Father, that Christians around the world that have this freedom would uh, take advantage of it, would afford themselves of these opportunities and come to the buffet that you provide for us in these 66 books. We love you, Lord Jesus. Give us strength of faith, strength of body to serve thee well. In Jesus' name, amen.